Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black, the Eye on College Basketball Podcast. It is presented by Jersey Mike's. Jersey Mike's, a sub above. Cal Boone is here with me. He's at home in Oklahoma. I'm in a hotel room in New York City, fresh out of the studio for CBS Sports Network. Don't get used to these suits and stuff on the podcast, because uh, the next episode, I'll be in a T-shirt or a hoodie. I'll look more like myself, at least my podcast self, I promise you. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent, and if you haven't yet subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel, please do that while you're here. Okay, let's get into it. The first Sunday of the 2023 NCAA tournament, it is in the books, which means the Sweet 16 is now set. There are uh, we're eight games on Sunday. We're going to touch on most of those, if not all of those, before we're done. But I do want to start with what was, I feel like, the game of the day. Kansas State, Kentucky in Greensboro, standalone window on CBS. It's America's most watched network. It's a network of stars. Final score, KSU Wildcats 75, UK Wildcats 69. Marquise Noel he had 27 points, nine assists, three steals, just made one big shot after another in the second half. So now after being picked last in the preseason Big 12 poll, Jerome Tang is in the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament in his first season as a Division I head coach. It's incredible stuff. Kyle Boom, was Kansas State over Kentucky the most entertaining game of this NCAA tournament so far, or is there something else in competition with it? Uh, I think it was definitely the most entertaining Uh I think people look at probably this result and think, oh man, that's a little bit surprising. But you watch this game, Kansas State kind of had more talent than Kentucky. Felt like they were a little bit better coached. This was not a fluky outcome. Kentucky was a slight betting favorite in this game. Um, and so people, you know, it's like number three seed ousting a number six seed. And it seems like, oh, like, that seems reasonable. But the way that Kansas State did this was very, very impressive. Marquise Noel was fantastic in this game. He had 23 points, 23 of his 27 in the, sec in the second half. Um, thought it was really interesting. Marquise Noel was, was, asked, was asked about the Kentucky matchup after Kansas State won its first round game. And he had two words. He, he said, kill him. That's all he said was just kill him. And uh, it was awesome to see him back it up. First team all confidence is Marquise Noel. Thought he was really, really good. Had 27 points in this game, nine assists. Keontae Johnson, only 5 of 14 shooting, and yet Kansas State is able to come out with a win. I think there's probably more questions on the, Kansas, the Kentucky side, obviously about John Calipari and this Wildcats program, but really good win, really, really impressive stuff from Kansas State from Jerome Tang. I'm glad you brought up uh, Kansas State's talent as it compares to Kentucky's talent because Jerome Tang also brought it up in his own way after the game. It was um, in, a, in a media scrum, I think, after his more formal uh, post-game press conference. Here's what Jerome Tang had to say when he was talking about uh, the 40 minutes his team had just played against Kentucky. Jerome, how much of a statement is this for you and your program first year? Be the program like Kentucky and you're going to New York to play in the Sweet 16. Well, you know, we have a program that's rich in tradition also. And the, you know, I mean, like all those old dudes that played for Kentucky, they ain't coming back, right? Like, so, I mean, uh, tradition does not help you if you don't get out there on the floor and play with some dudes. And I, we had more dudes than they did today. And that, that, that's what that was. So this is interesting because I think you can reasonably argue that he's correct. I mean, if we were putting all of these players, in fact, let's do it. Let's put all of these players in a college basketball draft. Who are you taking first overall? After what we saw today? Um, I mean, in today's game, you would take Marquise Noel. I got it. But like yeah, broadly speaking, yeah. who are you taking first? Yeah, you take Oscar Sheboy first. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. But are the next two Kansas State players? Are the next two Marquise Noel and Keontae Johnson? Probably, right? They are. Yes. For college basketball, we're not doing an NBA draft, but for college basketball, you could argue that two of the best three players on the court, not two of the best three players in today's game necessarily, but two of the best three players on the court were Kansas State Wildcats. So what, what I find most interesting about this is like, how did we get here? Because Kentucky was a preseason uh, 
top five team that was getting first place votes in the AP poll. They had another heralded recruiting class, the reigning national player of the year. Meantime, Kansas State was literally picked last in the Big 12. How did, to use Jerome Ting's uh, words, KSU end up with more dudes than Kentucky? Right. Yeah. How does Yale out-rebound out Baylor? Um, <laughs> it's wild. It's wild. I mean, and and maybe we're having a different discussion if Antonio Reeves doesn't go 1 of 15 shooting, but mm. when the guard that you kind of rely on as your sharpshooter has an off day, that can happen. Um, Kaysen Wallace was awesome in this game, 21 points, 9, nine rebounds, 4 assists. Uh, but the talent level and the I think the difference between the two programs was pretty stark I mean Noel was fantastic and took over this game he was the best player in this game by far and it's kind of interesting I think Kentucky's kind of stuck in a spot where they're not entirely sure which avenue they want to build their rosters because under John Calipari they historically have obviously built under the one and done model they've they've had you know John Wall and Marcus Cousins, uh, Anthony Davis, yada, yada. The list goes on. Um, and I think they've kind of course corrected in a way that is more traditional and in line with how teams are building the rosters now. They're going through the transfer portal, and they've they've added, I think, some pretty valuable guys, guys like Jacob Toppin, who, who've been playing big, big minutes. Reeves has been playing big minutes. But the talent level that they're getting out of the portal is not commensurate with Kentucky expectations. I don't think. And that has generally bogged down this roster and bogged down the postseason uh, successes that typically they would have under John Calipari and under Kentucky. So that's kind of a long winded explanation in my view of how things have gone from uh, pretty good under John Calipari to like, wow, is this guy like maybe on the hot seat entering next season? Um, it's, it's pretty stark to watch. Yeah, like I, I I agreed with the philosophy of trying to get older through the transfer portal. I thought it was pretty clear in recent years that the whole let's just get a bunch of young five stars and see where we it, – it, I'm not saying it wasn't working, but it had stopped working as well as it once did. And so I agreed with the philosophy about getting older via the portal. I just wonder if they got the right guys because, right. like, they they they, they – they got they added they added experience and age, but how many high level guys did they did they actually add? Kentucky level guys did they actually have? Because when you looked at this roster once the season got going, it was perhaps we all misinterpreted it on paper, including by the way the computers that had them. Um, I think Kentucky was preseason number one at Ken Palm, right? And so. Um, it wasn't just humans misinterpreting what Kentucky had as much as it was everybody misinterpreting what Kentucky had. And uh, because as the season unfolded, it became clear that maybe they can be good, but they, it appeared to me at least pretty, I don't want to say early, but certainly by, certainly by January, I was not out on Kentucky completely, but I was out on the idea of Kentucky ever being great. I just didn't right. see, the pieces that were going to allow them to be, to be great. And so the good news, if you're a Kentucky fan is that they have another influx of talent coming in from the, the high school ranks. They've got the number one recruiting class in the country. It's four or five star prospects. It's uh, the player ranks second, third, fourth, and ninth. In the class of 2023, most notably Justin Edwards, DJ Wagner. So they are going to have what we come to know as Kentucky talent in the program again next season. So perhaps that'll be the type of thing that, you know, gets Kentucky back to competing for Final Fours and, and things like that. And oh, by the way, I know the perception out there is that Oscar Shibway is done with college basketball. And I'm not even saying that it's an incorrect perception. I don't know why he would be done with college basketball. Where is he going? Like, do you have him projected as a top 60 pick right now? No, no, neither would I. All right. So like I kept reading today, like is Oscar Shibway's last game as a wildcat. And I'm like, are we sure? Are we sure? Like, even if he thinks he's sure, are we sure? Because what he is going to find out if he doesn't already know it in the coming days and weeks and months is that he is not a draftable player. And with name, image, and likeness being what it is, 
I, I don't even think it's a reasonable thing to suggest as much as it's an undeniably true thing to say. He can make more money playing college basketball at Kentucky next season than he can make playing professional basketball anywhere next season. So just keep an eye on that. It, it might end up where he's just out the door and he's ready to be done with it. But if he is basing his decision on finances, um, then then the, the smart thing to do, because he has another year of eligibility because of COVID, uh, the smart thing to do is to, to come back to Kentucky and, and, and play another season. And if you can put that guy with all these young guys, then maybe maybe Kentucky gets back to, to looking like a team that can compete for Final Fours and National Championships because Kentucky – regardless of the preseason rankings, both in the human polls and the computers, the they, they never really looked like that team this season. And then, you know, it, I, I guess it might sound like we're putting this all on the roster and the play. Like maybe there's some coaching adjustments that need to be sure. made as well because I was in studio tonight, CBS Sports Network, with uh, Roy Hibbert and Shelvin Mack, uh, two former NBA players, and they both noted how – when Kentucky's first action doesn't get them uh, where they want to be, that it just really looks messy after that. You know, they, they, they can, they, 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 like the offense is, there's been a lot of terms to describe it this season. Um, I don't know which one's exactly right. And, and, and I should know that the offense is not terrible. It, it's not as terrible statistically as it is visibly uh, as it is. Like when you watch it, it looks, old and it uh, and it looks like it doesn't look the way a modern flowing offense looks but it still ranks top 20 in the country in adjusted offensive efficiency according to Ken Palm but I had two former NBA players tell me like that just does not there's so many problems with what they're doing that that needs to be fixed and so maybe that's a project for John Calipari whether it's staff changes or just new ideas um, it, it does look like there's there's some coaching stuff that needs to be fixed there um, as well. The last thing I'll say about Kentucky, and then we'll get back to Kansas State, and then we'll move on. Um, I, I've been on set for like three hours, like live on TV for three hours, so I, I'm just sort of keeping my eye on Twitter, but I haven't had time to consume much of anything. But uh, the, I saw a tweet from the field of 68, and, and uh, I don't know what they said, so – because uh, I, I didn't have time to listen. But th those guys are my friends. I, I don't bring this up for any other reason than it, I, I thought it was an interesting way to phrase it. Uh, the tweet was, uh, was Kentucky's season a disappointment? And I don't even like, I don't even know how you could answer no to that. Of course it was. It's a preseason top five team, number one at Ken Palm, uh, projected to win the SEC. They don't win the SEC. Um, they, they struggle you know, to, to the, to a degree where they were unranked for you know, large portions of this season, uh, they finished third in their league and then they're out in the round of 32. There's no way that I, there's no other answer to that question. Was Kentucky season disappointing? Then of course it was disappointing, right? Yeah, of course. I've got a screenshot pulled up here of our final four predictions uh, from the preseason. You had them in the final four. Uh, Norlander had them as his title pick. I had them as my title pick. David Cobb rightly stayed away. Jerry Palm had them as the national runner-up. So that was legitimately final, a uh, final ex uh, preseason expectations for this Kentucky team. They were clearly top five team coming into the year, and yet as the season got, went along, it's like eh, we need to readjust expectations. This is not maybe the Kentucky team that we expected. Still. By any reasonable measure, I think this Kentucky team underperformed and not going to the Sweet 16, not being a real factor in the SEC race. For Kentucky, for John Calipari, this falls well short of what I think Big Blue Nation has come to expect. There's no question. Um, back to Kansas State. Uh, Marquise Noel was obviously the star of this round of 32 game. And it is players like him that really capture, can capture – the nation's attention. I don't know. I wonder how many people tonight just know the name Marquise Noel who didn't know that name yesterday because he was on a standalone window on CBS and just bombing from all over the court. And like, he might be taller than me, but not by much, like not, not much. Like I, 
I feel like I could post up Marquise Noel. <laughs> like I, 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 I'd back him down and, and I'd ask for the ball. And I feel like I could, I could maybe, maybe score. He's a little guy, but boy, is, he's an awesome, awesome college basketball player. Just a treat, fun to watch. And in this NCAA tournament, he's now averaging 22 points and 11.5 assist through these two games. And according to Jared Burson, who is uh, the father of ESPN stats and info, that's right. Uh, Noel is the first player to average at least 20 points and 10 assists in two games en route to the Sweet 16 since 1989. Shouts to Taylor Swift. It's a long time since anybody's done anything like what he's doing so far. And I know that I tweeted that after the regular season, I would have voted Bill Self as my national coach of the year. But like we explained when we were talking about National Player of the Year, we do not actually at CBS Sports vote on that until after the Elite Eight. And with Kansas eliminated in the round of 32, with Marquette and Shaka Smart eliminated in the round of 32, I think it's very possible that I, I don't want to speak for anybody else, that I will get to a point where um, by the time it's, time to cast a ballot at cbs sports i i can see myself casting it for for jerome tang at kansas state first time division one head coach inherits a program that lost a lot last season um remakes the roster through the transfer portal picked last in the big 12 preseason poll and then gets a top three seed in the ncaa tournament and takes it to the at the very least the sweet 16 like that's national coach of the year stuff and um, when we vote, I, you know, he might be number one on my ballot. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I would agree with that. Um, we'll see what Houston does with Kelvin Sampson. Yes. Um, that's I think he will be in the mix. Nate Oates. Um, that, that, that's the thing. I don't know if people are going to be able yeah. to, I was about to say, pull the trigger on a, mm. but that's not, that's not the right thing to say. Um, I don't know if people are going to, I wonder if all of the stuff around the Alabama basketball program will prevent some people from voting for Nate Oates, because like Nate Oates should have been the SEC coach of the year. He just should have. Yes. Like Alabama was picked fifth in the SEC, and they were the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament. Like Nate Oates should have been the SEC coach of the year, but he wasn't. It was Buzz Williams and Jerry Stackhouse. So clearly there, at least SEC media, had um, an issue voting for, for Nate Oates. But if you don't have an issue, if you just want to say, hey, man, I'm not worried about anything other than basketball stuff. I don't care about nothing else. Then they, Nate Oates is is – totally reasonable you could vote for him for national coach of the year so we'll continue that conversation down the road again we won't vote on that until after the elite eight let's move on tom Izzo is back in the sweet 16 surprise surprise we'll get into that next first uh word from our partners and calvin you play golf you think you can win one of those green jackets at the masters well if it's for being the most loving neighbor of the year yes it's a tradition unlike any other the masters on cbs so Tom Izzo is back in the Sweet 16 as Michigan State Spartans beat the Big East champion Marquette Golden Eagles on Sunday. The final score was Mark, uh, Michigan State 69, Marquette 60. So Izzo is going to be coaching in his 15th Sweet 16, which ranks tied for sixth all time. Have you seen the list, Kyle Boone? Be honest. I've not seen the list. Then it's trivia time. Oh, gosh. It's trivia time. There are five coaches in the history of Division I basketball with more Sweet 16 appearances than Tom Izzo. Can you name mm. them? Mm. Mick Cronin. <laughs> not, not there yet. Give it time. Got to give okay. it time. <sighs> Who's that other UCLA coach? He was really good back in the day. What was that guy's name? What was that guy's uh, name? Uh, coach K. Let's see. Has he got to be up there, right? Coach K has 26. That's the most all time. By the okay. way, John Wooden, second best coach in UCLA history. Of course. He um he has 15, same as same 15. as uh as Tom Izzo. By the way, other coaches with 15, John yeah. Calipari, Bob Knight, Adolf Rupp. Wow. Okay. Yeah. John Wooden was gonna be my get my next guest. Um I'll let you fill in the blanks. Mike Krzyzewski, number one, 26 yep. sweet 16 appearances, which is outrageous. Dean Smith, second on the list, 21. Mm. Jim Beheim, third on the list, 20. Roy Williams, 
fourth on the list with 19. And Denny Crum is fifth on the list with 16. And after that, you got five men tied with 15 each. That's Tom Izzo, John Calipari, Bob Knight, Adolph Rupp, John Wooden. Um, Strong Joe, I know broadly speaking, it's never surprising to see Tom Izzo in the Sweet 16. He's been here now 15 times. But are you surprised Tom Izzo got this team to the Sweet 16? Of course. Of course. If you had said that only one Big Ten team would make it to the Sweet 16, they would be like your fifth, sixth guess maybe. I mean, Purdue would have been my guess. Indiana would have been my guess. I think I would have taken Northwestern. Um, I liked Illinois as like a plucky underdog. So, yeah, of course it's surprising that Michigan State made it to the Sweet 16. And the way in which they did that is all the more impressive. They took out a number two seed Marquette team that won the Big East in the regular season. They won the Big East in the conference tournament. And Michigan State is the only team left out of the Big Ten that is still standing after getting eight teams from the Big Ten into the NCAA tournament. Izzo, by the way, he's won 16 NCAA tournament games now as a lower-seeded team. That is the most of all time. Right. There's a Crazy. lot of little things like that connected to him now. Um 15 Sweet 16 appearances, 16 wins, as you noted, um, in the NCAA tournament as a worst-seeded team. That's a record. And the reason I wanted to ask you about are you surprised Izzo got this team is because this team was never, at any point in the season, one of the 16 best teams in the country. Now, obviously, you don't have to be one of the best 16 teams in the country to make the Sweet 16. Princeton's in the Sweet 16. But... um, it is true that this team was never one of the 16 best teams in the country. They never got higher Michigan state than 19th at Ken Palm at any point in the season in January. At one point they dropped all the way down to 46th at Ken Palm. They were 31st at Ken Palm when this NCAA tournament started. And after today's game, they moved up to 24th. So they're still not a top 20 Ken Palm team, but they are in the sweet 16. And uh, one of the things I remember in the season, I got a message from my buddy commander King. And he said, uh, he said, Hey, I just noticed you guys have haven't said a word about Michigan state basically all season. And it had never occurred to me until he pointed it out. And I was like, well, that Michigan state's one of the biggest brands. Tom Izzo is one of the most famous coaches, most accomplished coaches. Why in a, college basketball podcast that we do three times a week, are we never even talking about Michigan State? And the answer was pretty simple. Once you um, acknowledge what it is we largely talk about throughout a season, what do we talk about? We talk about big, big brands that are awesome or big brands that are a disaster. Like how many times do we talk about North Carolina this year or Kentucky this year? We kept going back to it because they were so surprisingly disappointing. Like, like might miss the NCAA tournament disappointing. And then we also talk about schools that weren't supposed to be good, but they are good. That's how you end up in your Kansas State conversations and your your Marquette conversations. And so where was Michigan State in all this? Big brand. They weren't disastrous. No, they they, weren't bad. But they weren't great. They were just sort of hanging around, you know, if you put it in computer numbers, hanging around the 30s and the 40s. Like they always seemed – on track to make the NCAA tournament, but never really seemed uh, on track to crack the top 20 or the top 15 or the top 10. And so they just sort of stayed off of most people's national radars for for much of the season. But boy, they jumped back on it on on Sunday. And there was Tom uh, once again in a post-game press conference um, shedding tears because, um, and I, 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 I love that. I mean, he like, you know, I, I've got to know Tom over the years. I've spent a lot of time with him. I I like him a lot on a personal level. And I love that he's not afraid to show his emotion. Like that, that's all genuine stuff. Like I know he can seem um, rough and like a yeller and certainly like a, a stereotypical old school college basketball coach. But um, you know, that, that dude's heart's in the right place. He cares about the right stuff. And, um, and I, I, I never, mind it when I see him have those moments like he had. And obviously it's been a tough season for the Michigan state community. Uh, there was the shooting on campus and, you know, I thought Tom was tremendous addressing the student body. Um, 
in the aftermath of that. And I think all of that leads to what happened today for that program and university being a special thing. It will never bring the the students they lost back. And, you know, basketball games and accomplishments are not magic wands. They don't fix anything. They don't, they don't, you know, take away heartbreak and tragedy. Um, but, but, you know, it, it, it can help in whatever way it can help. And, and I think Tom showing that emotion and that university being able to celebrate yet another accomplishment, it was, it was all good stuff. I, I'm not necessarily happy to see Michigan State win and, and happy to see Marquette lose. Like I, if Marquette would have won, I'd have told you how awesome it is to see Shaka Smart back in this position. But after the game was over, decided, determined uh, to see Tom share that emotion and, and, and have him back, not just in the Sweet 16, but in the Sweet 16 in New York City, in Madison Square Garden. Like, yeah, that's going to be fun. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. I mean, I'm not a Michigan State fan either. I'm a huge fan of Tom Izzo, obviously. Um, But yeah, shedding tears after the game on the court, shedding tears after the game in the the post game was fantastic. He was cutting up with Tyson Walker, who was a New York um, product and going back to New York to play for play in Madison Square Garden Uh, was very cool. Tyson Walker was really great in this game, had 17 of his 23 in the second half. And um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really cool. I mean, Michigan state is a, is a team this year that has not necessarily been top 10 caliber at any point this season. They've not been bad, but they've not been great at kind of, as you said. So uh, to get to this point, I think it is kind of a testament to, to Izzo's coaching uh, to kind of the system. And it's cool to see them get into the sweet 16. Real quick on Marquette. And then we'll, we'll bounce around on the other NCAA tournament games from Sunday. They'll be back. Yeah. I, earlier today, like I had a window in the afternoon where I could watch games and like try to get some work done, like work ahead a little bit. So I actually started like working on the preseason top 25 and one. And Marquette fans will know this. I, and I guess I knew it somewhere in my head, but it just, I'd either forgot it or just didn't focus on it. They don't have any seniors. Yeah. Everybody can come back. Like er- everybody from a team that won the Big East regular season title outright and won the Big East tournament is eligible um, to come back. And they're also adding like a five-star freshman as well. So I, after going through it, I don't know who I'm going to have number one. Some of it's going to come down to, does Jalen Wilson come back to, to Kansas? Does... Zach Eady come back to Purdue because Purdue is another one. I mean, I know that the way it ended is rough, but Purdue can bring back everybody except David Jenkins from a team that was a big 10 outright champ, big 10 tournament champ and a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. So it's going to come down to some of these decisions. Like again, does Jalen Wilson come back? Does Zach Eady come back? Does Oscar Shibway come back to Kentucky, Uh, Arizona, could bring back everybody except Courtney Ramey. Um, yeah. You know, it, 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 there's other candidates for preseason number one, but Marquette, after looking at it today, it looks like if Shock is able to bring back all of those important pieces and then add a, you know, a, at least one her- really heralded recruit, there's a case to be made from, and I know this is a disappointing day for Marquette fans, but you could look up in two weeks. And, uh, you know, people like me are ranking your team number one in the preseason. Yeah. This is Marquette team, by the way, that was picked to finish ninth in the preseason yeah. in the Big East. Uh, so it's disappointing you don't make it to the Sweet 16. Heck of a season. You get the regular season title. You get the, the Big East tournament title. And Big East player of the year, Tyler Kolek. Um, it's, it's a really cool success story. Shaka Smart going from... You know, kind of ran off at Texas to uh, really rebuilding this program at Marquette. This is a very proud, historic program for for basketball purposes. And uh, so, yeah, I, th- I think it's uh, it stinks. You're going home, but I think the momentum moving forward, like this, is going to be a power in the Big East for the foreseeable future. So we've touched on two of the NCAA tournament games from uh, from Sunday. It's uh, Kansas State, Kentucky. Uh, Michigan State Marquette. That means there's six more to get to. So let me bounce you through them real quick, and then you just take it wherever you want to take it. Uh, Xavier 84, Pitt 73. 
in that game. Six Musketeers scored in double figures. Among them, Jack Nunji, who was 8 of 12 from the field, had a team high 18 points. Sean Miller is in the Sweet 16 for the eighth time as a head coach. Xavier's going to play Texas in the Sweet 16 of the Midwest Regional on Friday in Kansas City. UConn, 70. St. Mary's, 55. Husky shot 45.5% from three in the game. Adama Sanogo, 24 points, eight rebounds. Uh, I'm not going to make any computer trick or jokes. Like, you know, the, the St. Mary's played one of the best teams in the country and they lost. But this is a team, if you listen to the podcast, you know, um, I never really thought, I well, I, I knew the resume never matched the computer numbers. That was undeniable. I, I never really thought, you know, watching them, like it's a good team, but are they really like, top 15 and is it really a top 10 team because the computer numbers were super duper strong i'm not going to sit here and say see they i told you so because again i I think uconn is capable of beating literally anybody in the country um by 15 points when they shoot 45.5 percent from three Uh, but it is true st mary's after being in the top 15 of most of the predictive metrics this season for much of the season um, they're out in the round of 32. Creighton 85, Baylor 76. Ryan Nimhart got 30. 10 of 10 from the free throw line. Creighton's going to play Princeton in the Sweet 16 of the South Regional on Friday in Louisville. I should point out UConn's going to play Arkansas in the Sweet 16 of the West Regional on Thursday in Las Vegas. Florida Atlantic 78. Fairleigh Dickinson 70. Janelle Davis, great performance. 29 points, 12 rebounds, 5 assists, 5 steals. FAU is going to play Tennessee. In the Sweet 16 of the East Regional, that's Friday in New York City. Gonzaga 84, TCU 81. Drew Timmy got 28 and 8 and then just started cussing all over television. The Zags are in the Sweet 16 for the eighth straight season. That's the longest active streak in the country. They're going to play UCLA in the Sweet 16 of the West Regional Thursday in Las Vegas. Miami 85, Indiana 69. Isaiah Wong got 27 points. Internet must be out. In Indiana, I ain't got one tweet from an Indiana fan. Boy, they were tweeting me nonstop when I just the other day was explaining on Twitter how considering we don't vote for national player of the year until after the Elite Eight that I could actually envision myself voting for somebody else other than Zach Eady for national player of the year by then if I believe I put like Drew Timmy or – Jaime Jaquez or I forget who, Brandon Miller goes on some crazy statistical run and gets their teams to the final four. Then maybe there's a case to be made for somebody other than Zach Eady to be national player of the year. And in that tweet, I did not put Trace Jackson Davis and boy, Indiana fans took great offense to this. (laughs) And I never uh, took the time to publicly uh, respond because like about the last thing I'm going to do with my free time is uh, argue with, people I don't know on Twitter, but (laughs) it's funny how people think you have all of these agendas that you just, they just don't even exist. (laughs) Like it's all of these, there's a million reasons floating around about why I left Trace Jackson Davis off of that list. Do you want to know the actual reason? Hand the heart on, on my, on my children's lives. Here's the actual reason. All I did was go in and pick out all Americans who were on teams that I could envision maybe going to the final four and then I ran out of characters. You know, you got a character limit, or at least you used to. I still hold myself to a character limit on Twitter. So I put Hami Haquez because he's on a two seed. And I put Drew Timmy because he's on a three seed. And I put Brandon Miller because he's on a one seed. And by definition, those types of seeds um, have a better chance to go to the make a final four run, which is what I was prefacing all of this on, than Trace Jackson Davis in, in Indiana. So Indiana fans, if you're out there, and I don't know that you are because the internet must be out because you haven't tweeted me one time tonight. Not one time tonight. That's the explanation. Obviously, if Indiana went to the Final Four and Trace Jackson Davis was awesome all the way, yes, he might end up being the National Player of the Year. It's just when I was listing guys, I listed guys from teams that I thought were more likely to go on Final Four runs than Indiana. And that's, uh, that's the honest-to-God truth, hand-to-heart. Hand-to-heart. I've got my hand over my heart. When you put your hand over your heart, does that mean you're telling the truth? Because I've lied with my hand over my heart before, if I'm being honest with you. 
Yeah, people yeah. always say that, like hand to heart. It, it implies you're telling the truth. And in this point, in this moment, I am telling the truth. I'm just saying I've also been known to hey, – I'll hand to heart lie to you too if I need to. <laughs> if I need to. If I need to. Got any thoughts on any of those six games? Baylor's going to the Sweet 16, baby. Baylor Shireman. Oh, I, was like, I was like, what? <laughs> you love to see it. Baylor Shireman, by the way, very interesting transfer who I think Kentucky targeted and missed out on. Went to Creighton, had a big game today, um, led Creighton to the Sweet 16. Creighton is the first team since 1997 to have two different 30 point scores in his first two NCAA tournament games. Ryan Kalkbrenner had 31 in round one. Ryan Nimhard had 30 points, as you noted earlier, in round two. Uh, so that was cool. Creighton went 22 for 22 from the free throw line, which is tied for the for the most free throws in a game without a miss in NCAA tournament history. Creighton was previously 1-7 in, in round of 32 games all time since expansion. So good win for Creighton. Baylor, the Bears, are going home. Baylor, the Shiremen going to the sweet 16 uh yukon st mary's um interesting to note yukon the last two times they've been to the sweet 16 uh they won the whole dang thing so hand to heart that'll be interesting to watch uh sonogo with 24 points eight rebounds he was big in that game Al alex dukas had an injury i don't think it really mattered but um yukon man when they have their gears rolling that team is completely dangerous they made all their shots in the second half and, and ran away with it but uh look like i think one of the most dangerous teams still left in the field obviously um they're four seed in that bracket so they will not be favored i don't think to come out of that region but it looked really good um so yeah st st mary's couldn't score uconn's defense held up pretty well there uh in the second half fau fdu um I will just mention here, uh, number 16 seed, Fairley Dickinson is going home. Uh, gave it a good fight. Uh, could have been the first 16 seed to ever get to the Sweet 16, but Dusty May and the Florida Atlantic Owls are going to the Sweet 16. They are up to 33 wins on the season. Um, after, after the game, Dusty May said, we're going to study Australian <laughs> rugby rules and get ready for the Vols. Um, seemingly alluding to Tennessee's toughness. So uh, that was cool. Um, that's kind of my bounce around thoughts. I'll, yeah. I'll throw it back to you. Aaron. Yeah, I thought that was a great quote from Dusty. Um, we were also in studio tonight with Amir Abdurrahim, the head coach at Kennesaw State. He came up to New York and he was awesome. Like it was his first time uh, as a studio analyst and he was terrific. If you had told me it was his hundredth time, it, it would have made sense to me. Um, if his coaching career, um, if he ever gets tired of that, then he's, he's got a career in television if he wants it. But one of the points he made, he said he was talking to the Tennessee staff. I don't think you would mind me telling this story. And uh, like, the, you know, at, at the Kennesaw State level, you're looking for buy games. You know, hey, is somebody going to give me a hundred grand to come play them? Like, you know, when you take money from high majors and that is in part how you fund your, your program. And so they were at least like uh, the, there was a possibility of maybe playing Tennessee. And Amir said that uh, he told uh, somebody on the Tennessee staff, I need a hundred, um, a hundred thousand and uh, plus $50. I need a hundred thousand to play the game and then $50 to cover my co-pays for my players that are going to have to go to the hospital afterwards <laughs> because Tennessee, man, it's a physical basketball team. And uh, I want to give them credit. Uh, like I thought when they lost the guy, I, I had questions about that team all season long. I thought they were incredible defensively, uh, very physical, but too inconsistent offensively to really do much in the NCAA tournament. Like even when they were top five at Ken Palm in the predictive metrics, I didn't think that was one of the five best teams in the country. And I didn't think they were a legitimate final four contender. And then when they lost to Kai Ziegler, I was like, okay, that's that. And it's just not. They're in the Sweet 16. And they beat a red-hot Duke team to get there. So that Florida Atlantic-Tennessee game is going to be a, a lot of fun. And, you know, I'm going to be back here in New York uh, next week. I'll be in studio, so I won't get to go uh, to the Garden. But these games at, uh, you know, the NCAA tournament at Madison Square Garden is just going to be awesome. It just, anytime you put 
like the Big East tournament in Midtown Manhattan. It's it's just different. I mean, I can't explain it to you unless you've been here, but it's just, I mean, the the buzz and just the you know, walking around the city and like, I, I can't, like, I can't wait just to be back here next, uh, later this week, I guess, um, with, with a bunch of, of, of college basketball fans. Uh, and I don't know who's going to come out of New York and make the final four, but I think this is maybe the one region where at this point, I think any of the teams left can beat any of the other teams. Like it's fl- just, for people to make sure if you don't have a bracket in front of you, it's Florida Atlantic against Tennessee and it's Kansas state against Michigan state. Now I will take Kansas state to come out of here at this point, you know, because my final four pick in that region uh, was Purdue. And so they're eliminated. And so if I had to take a new final four pick out of the East, I would take Kansas state, which would, I think then lock up Jerome Tang, CBS Sports National Coach of the Year. It would be an incredible story. But if you told me right now, oh, no, it's going to be Tom Izzo because it's going to be Tom Izzo. That's not crazy to me. Oh, no, it's going to be Tennessee because they've got better computer numbers than anybody else. I guess Tennessee, according to the predictive, predictive metrics, would be the favorite to come out of this right now. But if you told me it was going to be Florida Atlantic, I would also say I can see that. That Florida Atlantic team, I guess, is a Cinderella because they're a nine seed and they're from Conference USA. But like you noted, they've won 33 games. That's a good – That's a Princeton getting here is fluky. Florida Atlantic getting here, I didn't expect it, but it's, it's not that surprising. That's been a good team all season long. And if you go back and listen to our Selection Sunday podcast – that, that is the team I identified as the most under team in this bracket. And now here they are, two wins away from the Final Four. Yeah, I had Florida Atlantic beating Purdue in the second round. So um, I was right, but I was wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, like Dusty May after after the game you know, said basically, like, we, we don't view ourselves as a Cinderella. Like, we faced the number 16 seed, so we were obviously the favorite in this game. But even going forward, they're obviously the – the, the worst seeded team still standing in that region. They don't see themselves as a Cinderella. They, they, they look at themselves as they are a force to be reckoned with. They are, they're a really tough team. They won 33 games already. Um, and so, yeah, this, this FAU team could legitimately make it to the final four would not surprise me in the least. I think I would be picking. I think it, I think you'd have to pick Tennessee um, just based off the fact that Tennessee is probably going to be favored by more over FAU than Kansas State will be over Michigan State. Um, but it's tough. Yeah, that like that that is a totally wide open region where Kansas State, Michigan State, FAU, Tennessee, like who knows how's, who's gonna make it out of, of that region. Well, um, the the numbers have posted on this, and it's interesting because Michigan State as a seven C mm-hmm. and as a team that's lower than Kansas State in the predictive metrics, which is typically like that's where if somebody is higher in Kempom than another team, unless injuries or something, home court advantage, obviously, uh, the the team that's higher in Kempom on a neutral court is going to be favored over the team that's lower. That's just the way it works. Michigan State is a seven seed. Kansas State's a three. Michigan State at Kempom is 25th at this moment, and Kansas State is 21st. So KSU higher, and yet Michigan State opened as a one-point favorite over Kansas State. And to your point, Tennessee, five-and-a-half-point favorite over over Florida Atlantic. So I, I, if I went and looked at Caesars and who's the favorite to come out of the East region, it, it appears that that it is now Tennessee. Mm. Mm. Which is interesting. Feel, feels a little bit like Tennessee might be the true computer trickers of the NCAA tournament, not St. Mary's, but... Uh, we'll see. We'll see if they have the horses on offense to to make it out. I think the defense has obviously been fantastic for Tennessee. That has been kind of what they've hung their hat on all season. Number one right now in adjusted efficiency rate ratings at at uh, Ken Palm right now. Um, it's it's always been about the offense. No no Zakai Ziegler. I think that is going to be obviously play a factor in in how Tennessee moves 
forward. But um, yeah, that's that's gonna be interesting. I mean, the, the Vols have a legit chance, and the bracket has opened up in a way in that region where they could legitimately make the Final Four. Before we get out of here, um, and I should tell you that on Tuesday morning, Norlander and I will have a normal episode. We'll both be at home, and we will talk through the entire uh, Sweet 16. So I don't want to do that now, but I am curious, how many of your Final Four teams are still alive, and if you lost any, who would you replace them with now? Mm. So the Final Four teams that I picked that are still standing is huge. Alabama and Houston. Uh, I had Duke going to the final four and I had Kansas going to the final four. I would replace Duke probably with Tennessee. I think Tennessee is probably the favorite to come out of the East region. And then in the West region, I think I would pick UConn um, to, to make it out. I know UCLA is there. Uh, Gonzaga is still alive, but one of those teams is going to obviously cannibalize itself. UConn to me looks like it has kind of channeled the midseason um, success that it found. Where there was a stretch, if people remember, where UConn legitimately looked like the best team in college basketball for like three weeks straight. The polls did not reflect that, but a lot of the metrics backed that up. Um, they were, I think, as high as number two in the AP poll. They're starting to hit their groove in a way that I think we saw during the season. So yeah, I would, I would, my new final four picks, I think I would go Alabama, Houston, Tennessee, and Yukon. Would you change any of your picks? Well, I, I have to change one because I lost Purdue. I had Purdue okay. in the final four, um, but my other three are still alive. So I told you in the East, um, I lost Purdue, but I would replace Purdue with Kansas state. And then I would just stick with my originals, which are Houston, Alabama, and Yukon. I had Yukon in the final four from the jump. So you know, as always, we'll see. But it really should be a fun Sweet 16. 11 different conferences have teams in the Sweet 16. To break down real quick, uh, the SEC's got three. Alabama, Tennessee, Arkansas. Big East has three. UConn, Creighton, Xavier. Those are the leagues with the most. Three and three. Uh, the Big 12, best league in the country, only has two. Kansas State and Texas. And then you get one um, from the Mountain West, San Diego State. One from the Ivy, Princeton. One from CUSA, Florida Atlantic. One from the Big Ten, Michigan State. One from the Pac-12, UCLA. One from the West Coast Conference, Gonzaga. One from the American, Houston. And one from the ACC, Miami. I kind of like that. Yeah, You just got like a whole bunch of leagues represented. And now let's, you know, you're not going to get a whole lot of repeat matchups. And it's just, um, I don't know. I don't. I, I actually asked you before we started this because like, I've been on TV for three straight hours. I, 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 if there's stuff, there might have been stuff out there that I've missed. So I knew there were 11 different leagues represented in the Sweet 16. What I'm unsure of is whether that's a record, but it feels like it could be. And if it's not, it's got to be close. Yeah, it's, it definitely seems like it. Um, it's great. I, I think it kind of speaks to the parody of the sport. I mean, you've got the Ivy League represented. You've got Conference USA represented. I, this is the first time the Ivy League has been represented since Cornell, I believe, in 2010. Conference USA has been a long time. I think it was Memphis the last time um, Conference U, USA was was represented. So, um, obviously, Memphis is not in Conference USA anymore. So, it's fantastic. I, I think like the the parody gets increasingly more as as the years go by in the NCAA tournament. I mean, we've had two number one number number one seeds lose in the first round to a 16 seed uh, here in the last few years, and and that seems like it. It's not going to be a trend, but it seems more more likely to happen than ever before. And um, so it's great. This is what makes college basketball so awesome. There's so many different teams represented, so many different conferences represented. Um, a lot of parody. This is why March Madness is truly amazing. It's now 2.21 a.m. on the East Coast, uh, which seems to it seems like a reasonable place to stop for now. So shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck. Shouts to Larnell. And thank uh, you guys, literally from all over the world, uh, for listening to the Island College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify over at Apple. Leave a review, please. Five stars. Type some words. There's more of us than there are of them. It needs to be reflected in the comments. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please knock that out while you're here. In addition to 
thanking everybody else for staying up this late. Thank you, Cal Boom, for for staying up this late. Uh, you've pleasure. been gr- you've been grinding all day long. I know this is an it isn't easy to wait around at home all day for uh you know some bald guy to get off TV so he can come uh, <laughs> talk to you for fifty minutes or so on a podcast. But you did it. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, sir. Good I'll time. talk to the My rest pleasure. of you on Tuesday morning. Looking forward to it. Till then, take care.